have a question for Stephen. Once again, remember those that are not here tonight, they're going to be all part of our midweeks. I know some are at work this evening. So my wife is ill. And just continue to keep them in prayer. When you're praying for Sister Hunter's shoulder, just uh, pray for God to, to finish healing the back. It's much better than it was, but there's just certain directions I don't do. I don't have the strength with it. But my wife just tells me I'm not, not very patient. And she's probably right about that. It was a beautiful move of the Holy Ghost we had here Sunday morning. Amen. 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 And I'll tell you, church, whether we run 10, 100, or 1,000, that's what our goal is. Hello? For those that come in these doors to feel the power and the presence of God. That's right. I've often said it would be enough to keep living for God if I never felt His presence again after having been filled with the Holy Ghost. However, it sure is a whole lot better knowing that I can go to Him over and over and over right. again and feel His presence over and over and over Amen. again. Yes. Amen. You know, it's, I can I can live if I drank some water this morning and I drank some at noon and I drank a little bit in the evening. I can live. But it's a whole lot better to be able to sip some all day long. Anytime you're thirsty, you know you can go get a drink. I'm glad to know that God's always available there for us, and uh, usually the only time uh, He's limited is when we ourselves put the limitations on Him. Amen. Amen. And I uh, want to uh, ask Nathan if he would to come, and uh, he was probably wondering, Pastor, has changed his mind or something because I'm getting myself all set up. But I asked him. A month and a half ago, probably a month and a half ago, after he'd come to me and uh, began discussing feeling his call, and uh, I was going to probably announce things on a Thursday. But I did it yesterday, but we've been just kind of sitting back on things and holding back. And uh, I, uh, tonight, uh, he's finally going to get to uh, to say something that uh, I asked him to speak on weeks ago. And uh, I know it seems like uh, we have just we've had so many Thursdays that we've had to miss. And my father-in-law, their services on midweek too, and they were saying that he he's older than I am and been at this a lot longer than I have. So he's never had to cancel as many services as they have uh, this last year. And uh, Nathan, I don't uh, want you to have any doubts. Uh, about God's calling in your life, and I'm just going to tell you right up front from someone that has, since I was 21, 22 years old, well, since I started pastoring in '93, and someone who's never had a place to preach on a Sunday morning unless I was on the road and didn't want to preach somewhere. I have preached as good as anybody, and I preach worse than most. And I just want to tell you, my brother, before you step the pulpit, you'll never be quite as good as you think or quite as bad. And just always become the pulpit, just release it to God. You sow seeds, only He can take them and make you grow. And I want you to come. I gave him a topic this evening, and we want to share the pulpit. Um, that's the Lord just anoints him mightily, and the Holy Ghost falls, and everybody shouts me out, and I don't get a chance to get the microphone back. And if God does that, brother, I'll politely step out of the way. Um, as Pastor said a few months ago, uh, he asked me to teach on a certain subject for him. And it was kind of interesting because the very, very next day, I was in the trailer at work, uh, sharing an open lane with a guy, and the subject of church came up. He started the conversation, he said, where do you go to church at? So I told him. And then we got to start talking about, you know, about Jesus and everything. And then the topic came on to baptism. How do you baptize? And I said, well, we baptize in the name of Jesus. Well, how do you baptize? And he says, well, we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And immediately, immediately I thought to myself, I said, God, 
you're an awesome guy. Because that was exactly what Pastor wanted me to teach on. So tonight, um, after prayer and everything in the last few weeks, I have felt that I'm going to teach on defending baptism in Jesus' name. You know, a lot of times we we get to those points that, you know, we're talking to somebody and they come up with that, well, we baptize in the titles. Well, how do you come back at him with that? Well, first of all, you know, in Acts 2.38, it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, what they will go at, but if you use that verse, they're going to go to Matthew 28.19, which says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. But now, let's get to Mark. Mark 16, verses 15 through 17. It says, And he said unto them, Go ye unto all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Shall they cast out devils? They shall speak with new tongues. Now that was Mark's account of the very same thing that Matthew had, had written. And then the very next one, Luke 24, 47. It says, And that repentance and remission of sin shall be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You know, as I've said, people try to use Matthew 28, 19 as a basis for the Trinity, the titles. Although, there's not one place in the Bible that you can find the word Trinity. You can search all you want to, you will not find it. Matthew's account says, in the name, not names. You know, there's that grammatical error there that most people do not catch when they were talking about the Trinity. You know, if it said names, then okay, then maybe they're right. But it said the name. So it's, pl it's not plural, it's singular. That's right. Now, in Mark's account, it says, it records the same day, but mentions in my name. Luke's account records, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Both of these are talking about one person. We're talking about Jesus. Now, I want to take a look at Matthew 28, 19 really quick. Because if we take it and break it down a little bit, and look at the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Father, in John 5, 43, says, I am come in my Father's name. He didn't come in somebody else's name. He came in his Father's name. And the Son, Matthew 1, 21, says, And she shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. We look at the Holy Ghost. John 14, 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. I don't know if you noticed or not, but all three of those accounts there talk about the same person. They're talking about Jesus. So therefore, in Matthew's account, He's also talking about one person, not three. Now, another thing that you can tell, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Bible is not going to contradict itself from one thing in the Old Testament to another in the New Testament. Now, the Gentiles were commanded to be baptized. In Acts 10, verses 47 through 48, it says, Can anyone forbid water, that these should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. It didn't say that he commanded them to be baptized in the titles. Come on. He didn't say be baptized in the names of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He said be baptized in the name of the Lord. 
Now Paul, teaching in Ephesus, in Acts 19, verses 4 to 5, says that Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But Jesus' name. Now we were told that in the Bible that baptism is important. You know, in John 3, 5, Jesus said we must be born of the water and of the Spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. And that was Nicodemus talking to Jesus when Nicodemus asked him, what should I do to be saved? You know, I have had so many conversations with people at, at work about baptism in Jesus' name. Some have agreed. Some have disagreed. You know, this is, this is all I've ever known. This is all I ever want to know. You know, I believe what the Bible says is true. That's right. Here, all Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Not three. I think so many times people just pick and choose what they want to believe out of the Bible. They'll take that Matthew 28, 19. And they won't really dissect it like they should. The Bible says to study to show that self approved. You know, this young man that I was talking to at work. He said, "Yeah, they're all one person, but they're three different sect. They're three different people in one." I said, "No. They are one together." I seen the illustration happen one time where somebody had hard boiled an egg, and they had broke it. They had cut it in half, and they said. There's three different parts here. But there's only one egg here. And I told him that. And, you know, he didn't really want to believe me. You know, his dad's a pastor down in Fort Wayne. And so, you know, when it comes to somebody like that, you really want to pray for him. You want to tell them the word. Have them go in there and find where someone was baptized in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Right. Right. Come on. You know, Matthew was there that day. But Peter was not. Peter was not there the day that Jesus told them those words. But in Acts 2.38, he said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. So why would the word contradict itself. It won't. Right. Matthew was there that day that Peter said that. He didn't go up to Peter and say, hey man, you were wrong. Jesus said the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Right. He didn't correct him because what he wrote, he was writing in the name of Jesus. He chose to do it a different, little bit different of a way, but he was still saying, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Water baptism is a part of the new birth. You know, it's something that's very important. When we get baptized in Jesus' name, our sins are washed away, and we're made new. I can't remember where it was I heard it from, but I heard somebody say that they had they were baptized with someone and they said on purpose they said in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost on purpose they said in the name of Allah in the name of Buddha but nothing happened but when they said in the name of Jesus something happened at that point in the name of Jesus is a powerful statement that's right. That's Come on. Right. You know, 
I don't see anywhere in the Bible where someone was praying for somebody and they said in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, be healed. Come on. They said in the name of Jesus, be healed. That's right. That's right. So why wouldn't baptism be the same way? That's right. In the name of Jesus, be baptized. I think so many times when we're trying to, to talk to someone about God, you know, they, they'll try to convince you their ways. But their ways are not the way of the Bible. Don't let them get you off course. Don't let them let, make you stray off the course. Show them the Word. Show them in the Word where they're supposed to be at. Tell them to search it out for themselves if they don't believe you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Amen. I gave Nathan that, that scripture on purpose. I didn't know he was going to be questioned the very next day. But I, my, my background is not Nathan's background. I was not raised in the truth. And I... I just want to say, not to uh, finish off what he said, but to transition to the second half of what is going on tonight. I want you to understand that it does make a difference. Whether you say in the name of the Father, or the Son, Holy Ghost, or whether you say in Jesus' name, it does make a difference. The scripture is not always accepted easily. It's not always accepted quickly. But accepted it must be. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, Brother Jim, if you'll put it up there. And as Christians, church, I want you to understand this next year, if we're going to accomplish what God has laid in front of my heart that we're to accomplish this next year. I'm, I'm really excited about this Sunday already because I feel like God gave me the word for it two weeks ago. I think it was confirmed Sunday morning. And uh, I really hope we have a full house. But if we have two of you here, you're going to hear it. And then you're going to help me spread it. And then I'm not going to go any further. I'll end up preaching my message tonight. Galatians 1, 6 and 8 says, I marvel that you're so that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Now you understand that what we just read was strong language when you take it and look at what it means. But church, I want to make a very plain, very blunt statement to you right now. Baptism, any other way than in the name of Jesus Christ, but full immersion is non-biblical. Let me say it plainer. It's wrong if the Bible is the final authority. And church, we must learn without being hateful, without being angry, we must learn to look people in the eye and say, but that is wrong. That's not the way it was done in the Bible. And it's important that you, as a saint of God, know, not be afraid of going to Matthew 28, 19 when you start talking to people about God. I start my whole Bible studies there. Because I want them to go up front. I've been there. I've lived that. And this is how it's to be understood. Because at the end of the day, when you have a logical, reasonable, scriptural discussion with someone, you're going to look them in the eye and they're going to either say, well, it doesn't matter. Or they got it wrong. Or they're going to say, you know what, that's right. If they say, well, that's obviously right, then you look them in the eye and you say, well, what are you going to do about it? We've got water. You say that you, you realize that that's not the right way to baptize. Were you baptized that way? Well, no, I wasn't, but I see that that's right. Well, then next Sunday, well, we you see at 10 o'clock, and we'll talk about, you know, we've got to be able to look them in the eye and say, hey, you're wrong. And when, 
if, if they say, no, I, I, it doesn't really matter, well, then you've got to pray for them because God's got to speak to their heart and convince them that it does matter. Yeah, that's right. But what we can't do is just say, oh, that's okay. It doesn't matter how you believe because the Bible says if anybody preaches any other message of what the original message was, let him be accursed. And church, that's why we must hold tight to our doctrine. I, I want you to understand tonight that whether we have a large congregation or a small congregation, and I honestly believe in all my heart that if we accomplish the will of God, we will have doubled this next year. If we don't have three complete new family units sitting here, I'm going to be very disappointed this next year. And I think we're going to have more than that if we do what God has laid on my heart. But it's not going to happen because we say, oh, it doesn't matter what you believe. You know, we want to accept you as you are. We, 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 you know, we'll just love you as you are. And just come be a part of us and, and just come worship with us on Sunday morning. You know, that may be the first step, but that's not what we're after. We're not a consumer-oriented organization. Can I say to you that we live in a world in which uh, the church is supposed to be seeker sensitive? How many of you have ever heard or read on a website or a church talking about itself say that it was seeker sensitive? Anybody here? Anybody? Okay, it's all over the church literature. What it basically means is a good concept is that we, you know, we're sensitive to the needs of people that come so that we don't run them off. And we live in a world in which it's become so extreme that the church has become afraid. And I use the term the church loosely. Afraid of running uh, anybody away so badly that the church has become afraid to speak the truth. And the truth must be spoken in love. We're not to be offensive, but we're to understand that sometimes truth can offend. And so I wrote down the church is not a customer-based entity. We're not sales, but looking for prospects. Yes, you can say we're selling the gospel. I've probably said that at times myself. We want to put our best foot forward. We spent a whole year trying to put our best face forward and remodeling our facilities. We've got the best deal in town. We've got a modern looking facility. We've got everything we need physically to have revival. But what we need to understand is we're not about a facility. We're not about a song service. We're not about taking up the offering. We're not about a lot of things that churches can focus on. We are about confronting people with the simple fact that the Bible declares that they're lost and in need of being saved and anything less than what the Bible declares is salvation is not enough to get them to heaven. If we were a customer-based organization, well, then we've got to remember the first law of business is that customers always right. I sold carpet for six years in a, in a store called Carpet Weavers and one of the owners was a former cop. And he went from being always right Hey, when well, you got the badge and you got the gun, you walk in a situation, you're the law, you're always right. He went to being in a store, working retail and selling to people, and even when he, they were just dead wrong, he couldn't tell them that always. Except couching in the most soft and polite terms so as to make sure you don't offend them. The customer is not always right. When people walk in these doors, and maybe I've been guilty of not emphasizing both sides of the coin. Now. But yes, we've got to love them. The two-minute rule has got to apply. They've got to know that we love them and we're willing to accept them as they are when they come through the doors. Now. But our love is also with an understanding that we cannot let them become a member until they change. Why? Because God has not thrown open the kingdom of heaven to adulterers and fornicators and liars and thieves and, and those who are this and that and the other. But rather the Bible said this is a straight way and a, a narrow gate that leads to salvation. Big wide path goes to the bad place. We are a church. We're a living organism. The blood and the life of Jesus Christ is our heart and soul. But the word of God is our structure and our framework. And as we present people the truth, it's got to start by looking them in the eyes and saying, you know what? Uh, you know, I know you were taught that. I used to believe that. Or maybe my mom used to believe that. Or my family came out of that. But you know what? We saw in the Bible where every single time they were baptized. Every single time. What do you do with that? Did they screw it up? It says here in Acts in 
that Jesus spent 40 days with them after the resurrection. Talked to them about the kingdom of God to make sure they got it right. Did they mess up? Was the church not going to screw up? Or did it, does, it, does it really matter? And if it really, you know, it must really, I'm sure it really matters. Well, then, hey, we got water. Well, I don't want to do it. Why not? What's, what's holding you back? Truth and love. Understanding that we have got a mission to change peoples. We're not a, you know, a corporation. Yes, we're incorporated. We're not just a business, although we have business practices. We've got bylaws. Uh, next uh, month, I will start announcing a business meeting, the last Thursday night of the month, according to our bylaws. And, and we'll do all the stuff you're supposed to do at a business meeting. But you understand that we're not just a corporation. We're not just a, a, a business. We're not just a, a civic organization. But we are a church. And we're seeking converts, not members. That's right. That's members are the byproduct yes. of having converts. Not the other way around. If we take, if our goal is seeking members, then you understand, at some point we'll be no different than the Baptist. That's right. Because everybody will come in unchanged, unborn again. And you know what happens if you get a, a room full of people that are not full of the Holy Ghost? No one's been baptized in Jesus' name. No one's been taught any sound doctrine about the new birth. You get a bunch of unspiritually minded people who've not even been filled with the Spirit, much less they're being led by the Spirit, then controlling the church because they'll think they're part of that organization. They'll think they're part of a business. They'll think they're part of a, a civic group. But church, we are the bride of Christ. We're the people of the living God. And it's not my way or the highway. It's not your way or the highway. But in the end of the day, it's God's way or else. Yes. We've got to present it with love. We've got to present it with compassion. We've got to be patient. I didn't accept it right away. I spent three hours arguing with the preacher. And then it was several months. But I finally found myself in Paul's shoes. It was hard to kick against the bricks. It was hard to accept the fact that I couldn't argue with the Word of God. Those three questions I tell you that if people come to, I'm not telling you something I learned in a book. That's what I came to. Is it wrong? Was it started on an error? Or is it right? And when I finally said, well, you know what? I just can't accept the fact that the Bible's not right. Then the question was in my mind, and God's speaking to me, well, what are you going to do about it? Why? Because God's goal was not to make me a member of the local United Pentecostal Church. God's goal was to convert me to the Gospel. God's goal was to see me born again. And my goal is not to fill this place up with members. My goal is to fill this place up with converts. That's right. That's right. Now, having said that, that goes without saying the church has got to have standards. And I know standards has become a, a dirty word in yeah, I'm not talking necessarily about everything you may think I'm talking about. The standards are essential. You know, the U.S. used to have a gold standard. They abandoned it in 1929. Inflation and things were going on just preceding the Depression, which was about to hit. In 75, they finally just completely did away with it and started trading gold on the open market, making it a commodity. And now gold's prices goes up and down like the stock of GM or any other company out there. The world's standards go up and down. When I say standard, the things that the world believes, that the teachings, the doctrines of this world, they go up and they go down. Two generations ago, you could not be a practicing homosexual and be a member of Congress today. You can be. Two generations ago, you could not be two husbands in a relationship and adopt a child. Today, you can be. Two generations ago, Miley Cyrus would not have been celebrated nationally. It was 50, 60 years ago that they would not even show Elvis above, below the waist because he was swinging his hips a little too wildly. The world's standards change. And not only has the world's standards changed about lifestyle, but the world's standards has changed as far as what it accepts theologically. It's gone from accepting the Bible as the final source to... Basically, just whatever you believe. Because now we can't offend anybody. Now we can't 
No one's wrong. Everybody's got their own truth. I'm here to tell you tonight, church, because you need to know for yourself and you need to know for those that you're going to teach Bible studies to, you're not entitled to your own truth. I'm not entitled to my own truth. And understand that the United Pentecostal Church is not the only organization that's preaching the truth out there. But I'm telling you, the only ones preaching the truth are pre preaching what the apostles preached. Right. Right. Nobody ever got baptized in Matthew 28 19. Brother Nathan, not one single person. That's no different than me saying, Ben, go to the refrigerator. And half an hour later, he hadn't gone to the refrigerator and brought me what I wanted. I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be ticked off. Why didn't you do what I said? Matthew 29 again, it's just simply a command. It's not an action. We see that action carried out by those it was given to us, Brother Nathan brought out. Church, we must have a standard, and that standard must be based on Scripture. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now, I've caused some flack over the last few years. None of you in this room here tonight are old enough to really understand. But can I, I want you to understand. Let me just ask you, as human beings, have y'all ever changed your mind on anything? Have you ever just thought you were dead set right and had to back off and say, well, maybe I wasn't quite as right as I thought I was? Or maybe you, 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 you maybe it's all well meaning. Why am I saying that? Because the apostolic movement, in some ways, is going through a course correction. You know what's changing slowly but surely? I'll tell you some things that are changing slowly but surely. I'm talking to home folk tonight. I sat in a district boardroom not two months ago with my elders and refused to tell them I would shave off my go feet, my goatee, if it was a requirement of license. Is it that important to have hair you? No. The important thing to me is the Bible is the final answer. God is my creator. There's a principle there. The Bible says and warns against teaching the commandments of men as doctrine. How many of you have heard in your time in apostolic that you know, if you're a minister, you're not supposed to have a TV or you're not supposed to have TV at all? Okay? Our organization changed that this last year. Is it because TV is suddenly more holy? No. Look to everybody and say, TV ain't holy. But now I'll say from the pulpit what I've always said and what you've always known, not everything on it is ungodly though. Right. Hello? Right. And so I'm sharing this with you as the home church because I want you to understand we as people swing sometimes one way and we swing another. And so you'll get, you get worried about something and so you go overboard. You mamas, when your first baby, you worried if they got near a piece of dirt. But when you second went, oh well, it's just a bug. They got some extra protein. You know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you can overreact. And there's at times we, because of fear, will draw lines that the Bible doesn't draw. Hello? And we've got other sister groups that preach the same message that never outlaw TV. Why? Because the principle is you don't set anything wicked in front of your eyes. You don't put anything worthless in front of your eyes. That's the principle. You don't commit adultery in your heart by watching stuff that's evil. That's the principle. Our law in the box doesn't do any good. What did the devil do? He gave us different types of boxes by a different name. Right, right. And so now we're swinging back to where it's the principle. And so we change what our, law, our, our rules are for ministers. That no matter what medium you were on, not to watch anything bad. And he took out that one little sentence that said, that a minister shall not have TV if he's not a license. I was sharing something else with someone the other day. I don't go there. The church has got to have standards. And that standard has got to be the Bible. Who's got a Bible here tonight? The one bad thing about these screens is we just got to have having Bibles with us. The church 
has got to be based upon Scripture. What we teach people must be based upon Scripture. Sister Candy can tell you when she was functioning as a youth leader, uh, long before uh, Nathan ever showed up, I believe. We, he wasn't in Carolina, were you? Did they, were you there then? I think that was before. That was pre Nathan. I sit there and argue really hard along with that young lady. I think I was going to say itself. If you'll forgive me, I'm going to give say that now. But I argued hard and long with her about whether some, certain things were sin or not. Because if I want to look you in the eye, Emmanuel, and tell you it's sin, and you're going to go to hell for it, I'm going to have Scripture. It ain't going to be my opinion. It ain't going to be what I think. I'm going to give you a chapter or a verse that if it doesn't name it, it sure applies to it. Because if it's sin, it doesn't matter what I think or what you think. Right. I'm just delivering a message. Hey, don't get mad at me. Get mad at God. He's the one that said it. But if I tell you something's wrong and you've got to give it up and it turns out it's really not wrong, you know what? I just put a yoke on you. I just taught a, a, a commandment of me as if it was something of God and I put a yoke on you that God never intended for you to have. Can you, th can you think of the word Pharisee? And that's why I'm so careful about saying, thus saith the Lord. It's got to have some principle of the Word of God. The church has got to have a standard. We're not after members. We can't accept everything people want to bring into the church because we are bound by a standard. We're bound by the Word. We're held to the Word. We're glued to the Word. We're filled with the Word. We've got to hold truth.